Good morning. Come take your seats, please. This is a ginormous room from up here. And you guys are spread all the way across. Good morning, Joe Gordon. How are you, sir? Thank you. Hey, well, good morning. I'm John DeMint. I'm the chair of the FLC, and I want to welcome you to Orlando and the 2019 National Meeting. And as you take your seats, I I just want to tell you what the theme, at least from my standpoint, um, that I want to get into your brains and, and help you continue to think about this. Everything is about change and leadership and leadership change. That's kind of the message this morning. I hope to help communicate that. Dr. Walter Copan will follow me as the keynote talking about change in leadership. And then later today after the lunch, we'll have a session on what's going on at nationally, national level for federal tech transfer. So change in leadership are the things I want you to really focus on this morning. And, and the first thing is we're going to celebrate uh, a senator who is one of the fathers of tech transfer. He was one of the the authors of the Bayh-Dole Act. And Bayh-Dole was one of the the two key fundamental legislations put in place to enable tech transfer. And of course, Bayh-Dole is the ones that we think about for funding universities and and private uh, parties and and basically giving them the rights to, to ownership of the innovation. And then coupling with that, also in 1980, was the Stevenson Weidler Act. And Stevenson Weidler, of course, was more focused on the federal labs, which is what the predominance of folks here are this morning. And, and the key thing there was giving the mission of tech transfer to the agencies and to the labs. So it becomes a part of our mission is to do tech transfer. And the, the neat thing about Senator Bai is he is a change leader, right? Putting this, this legislation in place was, took a major leadership initiative. And what I found out, um, Allison Priano from our FLC staff and one of the ladies out there, Uh, in one of the the FLC sweaters. She wrote this great article that's available on our website. And what I found out about Senator Bai is that he was born, raised, and initially practiced law about an hour from where I live in Terre Haute, Indiana. Early 60s, he comes to D.C. as Indiana U.S. Senator. He is the author and co-author on the 25th and 26th Amendment to the Constitution, um, dealing with presidential secession, disability, and, and lowering the age of voting to 18. The man is a change leader, right? That's, that's, what, that's one of the great things about celebrating the life and, and career of, of Senator Bai. He was also involved as a change, changing things and leading things, uh, but not necessarily successfully constitutionally. And it was on Equal Rights Amendment and also on, um, um, get this, uh, trying to eliminate the Electoral College. So two items that are very prominent still in our community and our society, right? The man's a change leader. And so we just celebrate his life and and his contribution to our field. The next thing is on your smartphone, because I know you all have one, how many of you have already downloaded the app? Okay, maybe I'll say it a different way. Who hasn't downloaded the app that's willing to raise their hand? (laughs) Please download it. It's a wonderful tool. I'm IT absolutely challenged, and it was easy, and and I was able to do it. You can see who's in the room. You can get their points of contact. You can see the agenda. You know, you would have known that the speaking was here as opposed to next door. Sorry about that. I I, I wish I I had taken care of that earlier. But why this is so important, not just for your personal benefit, is that we're in the middle of change at FLC, and we have three sessions, one today, two tomorrow, where we're going to be polling you. There's polling in there. And with a large crowd like this, what we're trying to do is get your input, your, your, your feedback on key things that help set the course of where FLC is going. We are a membership-driven organization, right? We're of you, we're for you, we exist purely to serve you. <clears throat> and the polling and the tools there is what we need from you to help do this. So that's why I'm so um, adamant about trying to get everybody on the tool so that you can uh, be part of that voting a little bit later. And if you have any issues with that, you just go out to the registration desk. All those nice folks at the, at the table will take care of things. So FLC's mission is promote, educate, and facilitate. And we're going to be talking about this throughout this, this week. But before we get to there, 
Um, I talked about change in leadership. And we are blessed to be in a period of time this last year where the federal government, starting with the president, uh, working through the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, OSTP, and Dr. Jennifer, she is here as well. She'll be talking after lunch. And then we have Dr. Walter Copan, who's our keynote speaker, who is the uh, director of NIST, has been leading the return on investment, the ROI initiative. So lab to market out of OSTP and ROI out of NIST are two programs that are joined at the hip, but they're changing the way we do federal tech transfer. They're looking at policy all the way to down to things like how do we start doing copyright. So high level down to very practical at the lab level. The question isn't, is change coming? The question is how much change and how fast? It is happening. So that's the landscape that we all exist in. And from an FLC standpoint, and, and, and Dr. Copan, as well as the panel after lunch, will be going into details about what those mean, and you'll have an opportunity to actually ask questions. And of course, the beauty of some of the national meeting stuff is you have access to these people throughout the day. You can stop them and ask them questions. And, and I can with Dr. Copan, you can call him Walt, right? And say, Walt, tell me about what's going on with ROI. And you'll find him incredibly engaging. And, and as you'll hear when I read his bio, he's one of us. He's a tech transfer practitioner, plus he's been part of the FLC as a national advisory committee. So with that, in this national landscape of change and leadership that we're seeing from the president to Dr. Copan, the question is, what do we do at FLC? And there's kind of three big areas I want to mention to you uh, that we're working on. And the first one is on this mission. What we've heard from you is that promote, educate, and facilitate really resonates. And, and I would tell you, when you look at the legislation, there's 11 statutory requirements of FLC. They're nicely synopsized in promote, educate, and facilitate. We've heard that from our, our clients and the stakeholders in the room, including our agency reps. They said, we want you to build on that. We want you to help us more through these three veins. So they become the pillars that we're going forward with out of FLC. And so since last October, we've been in a strategic planning process. We're trying to see the change that's going on and adapt to the change and lead as the, we are collectively the subject matter experts on the federal tech transfer. We have an obligation and responsibility to lead during this change. And that's what we're trying to do. And that's why I'm looking for your input. You're to engage me and every other executive board member through the polling, through individually at lunch, at breakfast, to help us make sure that we are speaking for you because we are of you again. So in the strategic planning, this promote, educate, and facilitate. We're at a point where we have some initial language that starts to define these three better. And what that will mean is that they will start becoming objectives and goals. And in July, we will have a budget meeting which will actually start putting resources to align ourselves to go, um, go further do these items. So we want your input. That will be at the town hall, and I'll have a slide on that in a minute. But that's where you'll get first exposure to this, this draft language. Now additionally, we're moving uh, at a very quick pace at the moment where our contract for support, we have a contractor that supports us by a company called Total Tech. They're the folks you see out there, they're the folks you engage with on the website, they're the folks who make pretty much everything happen behind the scenes. They do a magnificent job, they truly do, and they've supported us for many years. Well, we're moving to a different type of funding vehicle this, this fall, and it's a cooperative agreement. So those of you who are familiar with, with contractual type words, and, and I'm not, we go from hard deliverables and timelines and schedule from a contractor to a partner who helps us execute the mission of the FLC. That sounds kind of subtle, but it's actually quite a radical change. And we're in the process of that, and that cutover will begin around the October timeframe. And there'll probably be some impact um, as we do that transition. So I'm telling you that so that if, if the regional meetings have a little bit of disruption, maybe slights of days, things like that, just know it's because there's a huge change going on. We believe the cooperative agreement is a much better vehicle to serve you through and to execute the mission of promote, educate, and facilitate. And lastly, what we're doing at FLC to try to lead this change is we know we have to execute differently. The model we have for FLC and the leadership is through a volunteer board or the executive board. And if, if I asked you guys to raise who has too much work and not enough time, just about everybody in the room would raise their hand. 
Well, it's really impacting the volunteer approach of the FLC, which is why we're going the cooperative agreement approach. But what it will mean is we'll start looking at the, the structure of the FLC. And not sure exactly what that's going to look like. That's actually going to take two to three years to play out. But I tell you this because next time, next year at this time, on the ballot will be a vote to change the bylaws of how we operate. And, and you, as member labs and as the lab reps who are doing the voting, you have to be an informed voter because these are some radical changes in radical times, which, are, which is all good, but I have to prepare you for that as, as the chair. So what we have to do between now and next April is that the regional meetings start to communicate what those changes look like, what we think that's gonna mean for you and get your feedback, right? We serve you, you must be informed and be a part of this and then you will have a chance to feedback. After the regional meetings, there'll be other ways to communicate that to you. Get your feedback, whether that's a webinar, whether that's emailings, I imagine it'll be a little bit of all that. The key is we're gonna go out of our way to communicate the change to you so that when you show up in April next year, you'll be an informed voter and, and my hope is you'll say, absolutely, it makes perfect sense because the FLC is all about trying to help me do my tech transfer job. And interesting enough, do you know what you guys say over and over and over that you need the most? You may want to take a guess. I'm sorry? Money? I, okay. Um, time? No, not coffee. I heard coffee. It's, you always ask for two things, but they're very much you know, um, linked at the hip as well. Marketing, and of course that's humongously broad, right? I, I don't know exactly what you mean there, but we're gonna find out. And how do we tell the story? We do not tell the story well, but we got this incredible, incredible story to tell about tech transfer. It's incredible value to the nation, it's an incredible value to the labs and to the agencies and to the missions of those agencies. And we just truly are not good at that yet. So I'm taking that on as a personal challenge that that's something that we have to deal with in our strategic plan going forward. Um, so like I said, we do these pollings, we do these events so that we can hear from you what the, what the members need because you are ultimately the customer. Now just a quick look at some of our key platforms that we deliver services. This has an internal flavor where we kind of turn inward to ourselves within the federal tech transfer world. A couple key platforms. Um, yesterday was education and training. I think we had over 200 people there. I want to say there's around 370 to 380 that's uh, registered for this event. So a huge number of our folks are going through education and training. One of the things that you value the most out of FLC. Tonight's the awards banquet where we literally celebrate some best practices and, and key um, above, and beyond, above and beyond type activities in the tech transfer world. Um, also in that internal focus, we have awards, we have ENT, we have these national meetings where I hope you take advantage of the, of the networking. This is the, just an incredible crowd that likes to help each other. Um, and as we turn to externally, this is that part, that marketing communication that kind of kicks in here. And we have a couple key platforms. One you've heard about for almost the last 10 years, and that's FLC Business. This, this attempt to pull all the, the IP and lab data from across the federal government so there's one place where every, someone can go who doesn't know anything about us, see what's available and find out who to contact. This is a great tool and we're still really in the infancy of rolling it out and making it even more useful. The other one that's really taken off is lab tech in your life. There's actually a booth out there and you need to go see it because there's like some VR goggles and things like that. When you hit that question that you get from your family members and they say, what exactly is it that you do? And you say technology transfer, and they just go, right? We, we've all gotten that. Well, lab tech in your life takes that off the table. You can say, look, Grandma, and you can take her to a house that's in a virtual reality, it's, and, and you can literally pan around the house and see products from federal labs that have been commercialized. Agriculture Research Service are using it for part of their STEM outreach. Uh, we plan on using it to help inform some of our, our other key stakeholders, uh, folks like on the Hill uh, who don't understand tech transfer either, right? So it's a great tool to help communicate what tech transfer is out there, if possible, and, and get a look at that firsthand because it's actually getting ready to go through the next generation of tool sets. Also, as tech focus areas, and Autonomous Systems is our tech focus area uh, for the next couple of years. There's also a booth out there, and Kevin Barcanero will be here 
tomorrow morning for about 10 minutes, giving you a kind of a, a, a look at that as well. And then lastly, kind of an external focus is SBIRs. SBIRs represent, um, they're like our target demographic for, for federal tech transfer. I mean, most of the licenses is with, with uh, small businesses. And so here's businesses who have said they want to do technology development. They have the business processes in place. It's what they do. So the question is, how do we go engage that target community? Well, we've been partnering with the Small Business Administration for the last couple of years, supporting their SBA Roadshow, which is where they go to cities and regions um, literally for a week and get on a bus and drive around. And they go talk to the communities about SBRs. And SPLC has been a part of that. And then we started again next month, actually, out in the mid-continent area. And, and so we go there, we give the talk about what's available from the labs, what is tech transfer, and we do one-on-ones with the companies using FLC business. Last year, we had over 500 companies uh, engaged through, through the SBA Roadshow. And now the question is, how do we actually do that better and more and be even more intentional about it? Because it's something we've kind of done as a pilot. So those are the major pieces. And I think there's the town hall for the voting. And this is Again, why we want you to get on the polling software and get the app down so that we can do that. And here's the first poll. So up your app. Not a lot of movement in the crowd from up here. So open up the app, and at the bottom you see the, the three lines, which is kind of that more. You click on that, and you'll see one or two where it's about polling sessions. And you'll be able to go to these opening remarks. And you will literally hit your button, and then we will see real time what you guys are saying here. So click that, and we will get a sense of how many of you people have actually downloaded the app. And this was also so I would learn how to do this, because I have a whole session on this later. Allison, do I hit the next button? So real time here, we're seeing what your, your feedback as a group is. <clears throat> so we're seeing 48% plus or minus that FLC resources business, lab tech in your life. So all the outreach stuff. Well, that's good to know. Tech focus area, you'll hear more about that. Kevin Barcanero's got his booth, so please stop by if you're one of the uh, 18% to look at that. So this is what it looks like. And at the, uh, there's, there's two sessions at about 11. I'm in one of them. I actually think, I'm not sure if it's in the room. But we'll literally be using this tool to start assessing the value and how we provide better return to the labs from tech transfer. So it becomes a very useful tool to engage the audience on what's important to them. So with that, without further ado, I want to introduce our keynote speaker. And I've, I've already referred to him many times. But I'm going to read his bio because it's, it's, it's one that you need to understand because, again, he's one of us. Dr. Walter Copan is the Undersecretary of Commerce for Standards and Technology and the NIST Director. Since being confirmed in 2017, Dr. Copan has provided high-level oversight and direction for NIST, including launching the Return on Investment Initiative. We typically call that the ROI. So when you hear that, that's the Return on Investment Initiative to maximize the transfer of innovations developed from federally funded R&D from the laboratory to the marketplace. He has had a distinguished and diverse career as a science and technology executive in large and small corporations, U.S. government, nonprofit, and other public sector settings. Most recently, Walt served as founding CEO and chairman of Impact Engineered Wood Corporation, an advanced materials technology company, and formerly served as president and CEO of the IP Engineering Group Corporation, providing services in IP strategy, technology commercialization and innovation. Of greater interest to, to our audience today, Walt is quite familiar with the world of federal tech transfer. From 2010 to 2013, Dr. Copan served as Managing Director of Tech Commercialization and Partnerships at DOE's Brookhaven National Laboratory. Walt also served with the National Advisory Council to the FLC for more than five years, providing industry inputs to advance the U.S. economic impacts of the federal laboratory system. Without uh, any ado, please help me welcome Dr. Copan to the, to the stage. John, thank you so much. Thank you all. It's a real delight to be uh, with you today. And uh, as John uh, so kindly said, I really feel that I am uh, with my family. This is my home community. We care deeply about technology 
commercialization, about impact uh, for this great nation. And um, if we can cue up the first slide, um, we'll be talking today about uh, sort of where we stand with our journey uh, of unleashing American innovation. This nation faces competitive pressures like we have never faced before. We are seeing a highly organized uh, competition globally, and the more intelligently we can create value from federal science and technology investment to create jobs, to create economic vitality, to, uh, to influence our balance of trade, and, uh, and ultimately the, um, uh, the strengthening of our economy. Um, this is the underpinning of what we're looking to do. Um, I care deeply about tech transfer, and I also am um, delighted uh, to be at NIST, working with a tremendous uh, team of uh, people, but also the broad interagency collaborations uh, that are represented in this room. So uh, with that, let me just recap for you uh, where, uh, uh, where we've uh, been, what our goals have been, and, um, uh, and where we're going. Uh, so this is all about recognizing that our laboratories create seed corn for the future of, uh, of the harvest of this great nation. And the country invests uh, over $150 billion per year. One third of that roughly is at the federal laboratory complex. And so the more value that we can then create in our economy and for society, um, through technology transfer, um, we create impact uh, to benefit all of us, our children, and future generations. Uh, we heard a little bit about these guys already this morning, and uh, it was a real loss to our uh, community uh, uh, in March when uh, Birch Bayh uh, passed away. Um, but you see here on both uh, the by Dole Act and in the Stevenson-Widler Act, um, a bipartisan approach that truly advanced commercialization from uh, our federal laboratory complex and from our universities. Um, and this is a, a moment that we are in today, is also a chance uh, to bring uh, bipartisan support uh, because at the end of the day, we're not talking about something that's political. We're talking about something that's impactful for people, for the economy, and, uh, and for jobs. Uh, and so this is a great heritage that we've built on since this foundational legislation of, uh, of 1980, the Bayh-Dole and the Stevenson-Widler Acts. We're also in a time of tremendous change. This is the time of technology convergence, which is a true accelerator to the invention process and to innovation. Um, and so as we look at the combination of humans with high performance computing, real time access to data and knowledge, uh, the influence of machines talking to machines and, and people interacting with machines and sensor networks the Internet of Things has truly become the Internet of Everything, hasn't it? Um, we are in the midst of uh, dealing with wearables. Uh, I was at um, uh, one of the NIST um, visualization laboratories yesterday, as, uh, so I was walking through a uh, 3D sort of holographic image of the human body, um, and basically the ability to sense within the body now um, utilizing sensor technologies and wearables, um, being able to do real-time diagnostics and intervention um, enables the era of personalized medicine. This is the exciting era that we're in, and it's a time of great change. And I was just delighted to hear John's comments at the beginning that the FLC is changing too, uh, because it's utilizing advanced technologies, it's utilizing the uh, uh, modernized tools and systems to enable what it is that we need to do. Uh, John mentioned a little bit about my background. Um, I started my career at a company called Lubrizol Corporation, specialty chemicals, 
Um, and uh, there I led the venture capital arm of the company, um, te technology strategy, and also the tech transfer and licensing business. And so I was actually one of the few people from industry who came to FLC meetings back in those early days. I uh, had the chance to meet up with Rick Trotta and, uh, and our uh, colleagues from the uh, National Advisory Council as well. And uh, they welcomed me as a, as a fellow corporate uh, member to provide inputs uh, for, the, uh, for the FLC. I also have to tell you that I was hugely disappointed um, because I found it so challenging to work with some of the federal labs. And uh, having been part of a global multinational corporation, um, we actually wound up working a lot more with uh, research institutes and universities internationally rather than in this country, which is a true shame for American taxpayers. You know, obviously, we all are, and we want to make sure that uh, we're truly getting results, that we're truly getting impacts. And so this is part of my passion. Um, in this time of convergence of, uh, of technologies, uh, we're seeing an, an impact to the mission of each of our organizations. How are we driving research? How are we utilizing artificial intelligence to create greater productivity um, out of the R&D and the discovery engines uh, that are represented? Uh, we have folks here from ARS. Agriculture is now the confluence uh, of uh, agrobiology and, uh, and technology with global positioning and with sensor technologies that are deployed through satellite networks. Uh, to ensure that we understand how we're fertilizing and how we're watering our, our crops and uh, when appropriately to harvest and then tying that in with data from agencies like NOAA that help the ag sector to look at their, um, their strategies for harvest. It's become an entirely different sector. Mobility, uh, and we talked uh, earlier on and John mentioned that uh, autonomous systems are going to be a big part of the conversation here at FLC. Uh, and so that brings together advanced communications like 5G and, and sensing uh, networks that have essentially no latency uh, to allow the uh, interaction between people and systems. Um, and indeed, we're dealing with uh, the applications of AI now in every market sector that, uh, that we see. I'm pleased to announce this morning uh, that the final version of the Return on Investment Green Paper uh, is live. There's a press release that has just come out uh, to time with this meeting because this is the community that is going to be um, impacted by using and leveraging uh, what we uh, hope are a new series of tools uh, to support our work in technology transfer for America. Um, uh, my good friend uh, and colleague, uh, Kelvin Drogemeyer, who is the head of OSTP, also came out with a uh, wonderful piece yesterday which ties together uh, with the ROI initiative, talking about the importance of innovation and innovation leadership for this country. Um, and as mentioned previously, we are in such a race uh, that we have never previously seen. We have highly organized competition. I met yesterday with, uh, with uh, several of my colleagues at NIST, uh, Mike Molnar, who heads the Advanced Manufacturing National Program Office, um, and who was one of the leaders in the Advanced Manufacturing Strategic Plan uh, that was released in October of last year, uh, came by and just showed me the Chinese version of the U.S. Advanced Manufacturing Strategic Plan. The U.S. did not translate that into China. It was translated on the same day in China so that they could be informed by the U.S. plans and strategies. Um, and China has announced uh, their 11th Advanced Manufacturing Institute. Their goal is to have twice the number that we have in the United States. So it is a very different kind of competition. Um, it's competition where we have um, Imitation being the sincerest form of flattery, uh, but the intellectual property systems around the world have become much more robust. 
Um, and although people discounted the uh, Chinese IP system and uh, the rigor of their scientific process, things have changed, haven't they? Uh, we see Europe uh, ascendant when it comes to trying to assert leadership in, uh, in economic outreach globally. Uh, and we see this in standards, we see this in, in the world of metrology. Uh, we see um, many of the devices that we're using now have not been manufactured in this country. Um, although many of the technologies, including the mobile phone, many of those were developed using federal funds, uh, but uh, Samsung and LG um, you know, are certainly very significant global players now in this space. So how do we as a nation truly recapture uh, the high ground of converting the results of our federal research into value first and foremost for this nation? It's a, it's a great challenge, it's a great opportunity, and we are in a time uh, where innovation ecosystems are more important than ever. Um, every laboratory, of course, has a national um, uh, presence and a national uh, requirement, but we also have local uh, engagement with the business community, with the finance community, with entrepreneurs. Um, and so the seed corn that's created by federal funding, that's accelerated by programs like SBIR and STTR, um, are indeed a, a critical element for us as laboratories to connect with to ensure that not only do we achieve our mission, uh, mission nationally, uh, but that we also have the opportunity to execute on that mission through entrepreneurship, through new business creation, through partnership um, on a regional and, uh, and indeed local basis. So that's a new part of the challenge for, uh, for many of us um, who have uh, seen this sort of national uh, vision and role uh, for each of our uh, laboratories, um, and that's indeed very important. But utilizing then all the tools in our toolkit uh, to ensure value creation. Uh, so the future of technology transfer um, is, uh, is really in our hands. Uh, this group represents the leadership um, of one-third of the federal investment in R&D. It's our jobs to ensure that we connect with the science, that we connect industry with our laboratories, that we create entrepreneurs and investors uh, with the opportunity space that's being created every day uh, by the tremendous research uh, that's going on. And so our, our role is really to lead the evolution of the paradigms of the future to ensure that we can operate really at the speed of business. I, I mentioned before one of the challenges that uh, I had faced in just working uh, with some of the labs that shall remain nameless. Um, it, it just took too long to get deals done. Uh, and, and so uh, looking now to the future, what are the tools that we need to uh, utilize? What are the approaches that we need to implement that will enable industry and entrepreneurs to work with us at the speed of business? The digital economy and the ubiquitous access to information um, is the backdrop of our work in technology transfer. Um, and so surely we need to have the right kind of checks and balances and transparency and accountability within our systems, but we also have a tremendous chance to move the needle for the country now. Um, and so this is part of the president's management agenda. I think all of you uh, have been aware that the Lab to Market uh, program uh, is one of the cross-agency priority uh, goals, the Lab to Market uh, program under the president's management agenda. Um, and we're delighted at the support that we re received from the White House, from OSTP, and understanding the importance of this journey to unlock American innovation. Uh, it's looking at the fundamentals of our tech transfer system and identifying what are the issues that have kept us uh, from operating at the speed of business, and what are we gonna do about it? What are the new tools that will enable us to manage or to share risk 
uh, where we know that within the federal enterprise, our entire um, cadre of lawyers have been, treat, uh, have been trained to absolutely minimize risk to the federal government. And so they're very much part of this journey of change as well. The ROI initiative is not about trying to get more money in for, the, for uh, research and development or for tech transfer. Uh, there are separate ways of dealing with that. But it's looking at transformative change that will move the needle for this country. Um, and that's my goal, and I know that goal is shared with, uh, with all of you, uh, to have the opportunity to transform tech transfer in a way that will move this country forward, that will create more value, that will create happier customers, that will in incentivize industry to come back to the interface with the federal labs. I gave some personal examples of, of how the labs, despite their best efforts, were actually chasing my company away uh, from working with them. So we had the launch event uh, in April of last year, uh, just a little bit over a year ago. Uh, Secretary Ross was, uh, was very much part of that. The leaders of the science and technology um, organizations of the federal government were very much part of this as well. And uh, the goals are those that I've uh, laid out uh, for you, and we've today achieved an important milestone together. The uh, preparation, the interagency review, uh, the support um, of the White House, the Office of Management and Budget has been uh, an important part of this journey as well um, as the inputs from literally thousands of stakeholders who've commented um, from the academic side. What, what is it that we can do to make it easier to work with the federal sector, with our laboratories? Um, what are the things that we can do to incentivize industry to come back to the interface with our universities and federal labs? Um, and truly to address our national and economic priorities. The uh, President's Management Agenda uh, goal is utilizing the sort of the standard format and we'll be reporting um, on this uh, periodically through the, uh, through the CAP goal uh, progress updates. Um, Michael Kratzios uh, had a quote as well as uh, mine and Secretary Ross in the press release that you'll uh, find uh, today. Um, and it represents all of the uh, science and technology connected agencies uh, in the US in this cross-agency uh, priority goal. We have the Lab to Market Subcommittee. Many of you have been part of that very actively. Uh, the Interagency Working Group for Tech Transfer, the Working Group for Buy Dole, uh, the SBIR uh, program is an essential part of this across the uh, uh, agencies, and we're delighted to have Jennifer Shea and, and her um, advocacy, her work um, with uh, the SBA as well, which has been so important uh, to this journey. Uh, the i community of practice, how do we, how do we help train uh, our scientists a bit more about the entrepreneurial and the business journey so they can be well prepared uh, to, uh, to embark on that? How do we prepare our postdocs and, and visiting scientists that are working at our laboratories to be part of that tech transfer uh, opportunity? And the FLC has been a close partner in this, and so we thank you, John, and, and all the leadership of the FLC for your engagement in this. Um, a lot of people said that we wouldn't be able to come out with a work product like this uh, so quickly, um, but it's a testament to the uh, to the dedication of the team and their focus on delivering against deadlines to make sure uh, that we're at this important juncture now. Uh, this is not a policy document. Um, it is a guide. It's a discussion piece for the future. Uh, and we're delighted to um, have had the feedback that's resulted now in um, a final uh, version. Um, this. Uh, document really deals with five primary uh, goal areas. Um, the first one is the one that I focus a lot of my attention on. What are the, what are the regulatory and legislative impediments uh, and, and what are the policies in place currently that are keeping us from being as effective as we can uh, in uh, doing our work in tech transfer? 
How do we increase the engagement with the private sector? How do we bring the investors to the interface uh, with our federal labs and do that in a way that's safe and appropriate? How do we build a more entrepreneurial R&D workforce? Uh, I talked briefly about the i as one of those tools of building uh, awareness. But not everybody's gonna be a CEO, right? Uh, you know, a lot of the i core uh, uh, curriculum was really developed around that concept of kind of looking at all the elements of operating a business. But most scientists are not going to be able to make that turn and become the kind of uh, leader um, of an entrepreneurial venture. The uh, work uh, that we've done uh, as we've talked about ROI is not just talking about financial returns. I know that when I first used that uh, term ROI because everybody looks at, okay, dollars in and dollars out, there's a certain element of that and it resonated certainly with my boss, Wilbur Ross, uh, who uh, comes from the finance sector, has had a stellar career in investment, um, and so he certainly also resonated with that moniker for this, uh, for this initiative. But it's really much more ab uh, about the broad value that we create for the economy and capturing the value for America. Uh, we'll be talking more about that at our panel this afternoon and uh, I'm delighted that, uh, that uh, Jennifer's here, that uh, Paul Zielinski, my colleague, uh, is here as well, will be part of that uh, discussion uh, about the details of what, uh, what has come from the national conversation uh, to which we've all contributed. A lot of the value that we create from the federal labs, uh, we basically give away, um, and, that's, and that's absolutely wonderful, um, except very often we give it away in an in uncontrolled fashion without protections that support U.S. industry. And so some of the practices that we're uh, going to be exploring um, are uh, the ability to assert copyright uh, by federal entities uh, that's currently uh, not included in the, uh, in the copyright statute. And we're not talking about written works or artistic works, we're talking about primarily digital products, computer programs. In the age of artificial intelligence, uh, since the United States is investing so heavily in AI, if we don't have the ability to actually capture the intellectual property behind the AI, then it's, it, is by statute freely given away to the world, uh, which includes to uh, the quite, quite clear competitors of the United States when it comes to economics. And so it's, uh, it's an interesting time, isn't it, as we look at intellectual property filings uh, using the PCT process, uh, rather than as many of our labs have traditionally done, uh, we file in the United States only. Um, and in so doing, we don't provide the protection for US multinationals who will be manufacturing not only in this country, uh, but also overseas, will be exporting to uh, economies overseas. So advancing American innovation has many components. Um, I talked about the five sort of large buckets uh, that we'll uh, sort of deconstruct a little bit later on today and, and talk about the, uh, the underpinning uh, findings that, uh, that have come out of the ROI initiative. But it's our ability to invent and capture invention, utilizing all the tools available. Uh, our uh, patent system, um, I must say, has been in a mode of resurgence. Um, uh, NIST and the USPTO have worked very closely together around the strategies to create a more reliable and predictable US patent system. Our universities, our inv in investors, our startup companies rely on IP rights. Um, and in order to be able to do those major investments that are required for a new therapeutic uh, or for a new uh, fuels technology uh, to be brought to marketplace, uh, those are major investments and significant capital investments as well that are uh, required. We'll bring up that uh, chart once again. Uh, a big part of it is, is tools and advancing and modernizing tools and John, uh, talked about the um, FLC business as one of the tools that we're looking at now for the future and, and how, do we, how do we make that uh, an even more 
usable tool for marketing, for discovery of technologies that are available, for aggregating IP across the federal sector, for looking at copyrighted materials um, that are digital products that are important for commercialization uh, for the future. The core is people, um, and you are th at the heart of bringing technologies from your laboratories uh, into the American marketplace. You are the people that create the jobs of the future, and you are the ones who look at creating the kind of connections, b making the matches uh, that bring together all the parts of a successful enterprise around the intellectual properties that are coming from your laboratories. It, uh, it's an exciting time, but the underpinnings, and, and I'm pleased that, uh, that John mentioned this, it's, it's leadership. It's the leadership not only that you provide to your organizations, but it's also the leaders of your laboratories, the leaders of the science agencies that have to have this built into their, um, uh, into their value system, into their priorities to ensure that the results of this national conversation about the importance of tech transfer are not lost in future years. Um, as a result of, uh, of this journey, um, this is also in the midst now of looking at our own structure um, and making some changes to ensure that we, within our organization, actually have a long-term focus on our national role uh, for tech transfer and to ensure that regardless of who the NIST director is in the future, that, that the people at NIST um, have that built into their job descriptions, have that built into their performance appraisal process. Um, many people who are doing work that relate to commercialization may not be able to publish as much uh, in terms of the number of papers just simply because they're doing other things. And it's all about the H factor, right? It's all about the citation indices of the science that people are so often um, uh, measured against. But for all of our institutes, for all of our laboratories, through statute, we have a priority to bring technologies to market. And so we want to ensure that that is not lost um, as a result of this. So this is building culture within each organization that understands the importance. Um, and it will require a lot of sustained effort, a lot of conversations, um, a lot of best practices to not only be shared, but to be used and to measure how we're, how we're doing against that. Um, as the uh, National Metrology Institute of the United States, we certainly focus a lot on measurements uh, and, and making sure that we can actually track uh, those impacts of our, of our work and the changes that we're uh, embarking upon. The other underpinning uh, of this foundation is the policy piece, to make sure that we have the legislative framework that we have policy and regulations that are modernized. The Stevenson-Weidler and Bayh-Dole Acts came out well before the digital economy, right? And so it's, it's important for us to ensure that as we go through this uh, process of, uh, of looking at the sort of the next phase of change, uh, that we do so on a bipartisan basis, that we do uh, across in the House and in the Senate, but also in every state of our union, that, uh, that all the members uh, who are our stakeholders for the future of our economy, for the future of the people in each district, uh, that they understand that this seed corn that we're planting in our federal labs, the seed corn that uh, we're planting in our nation's universities um, are truly gonna be harvested intelligently and, and not just cast to the winds uh, and hope that something takes root in this country, but will be much more purposeful in the future. That we as a nation will have the kind of policies that enable much greater flexibility, will enable risk shifting, will enable engagement with the entrepreneurial and the investment community, will have flexible partnership tools. And uh, so I'm looking forward to the next phase of this process. Uh, this is, as I mentioned, it's not a policy document or position, but it's going to certainly inform uh, the uh, conversations going forward. 
um, and also to look to building our innovation ecosystems nationally as well as locally. So the ROI Green Paper is out today, April 24th, and uh, we're excited to share that news with you. So the next stages are really working on draft legislative and regulatory reform uh, packages, and uh, they will go through the righteous interagency process, and, and there will be public comment um, as appropriate. Um, the um, uh, other aspect is to make sure that the inputs that we've received that affect other agencies will be delivered faithfully to them so that they can take appropriate action. Um, and for example, there are uh, implications for the PTO and for SBA, uh, for the i program and, and for others. It's gonna be important for us uh, to have an action plan and a deployment plan that we can work with. Um, and I'm delighted that the FLC is on a strategic planning journey because I see that these things will come together and uh, that the FLC will have as part of its work uh, the opportunity to take the output of this process um, and to utilize that and to help nurture it, building and uh, sustaining the culture across the FLC community. Um, and then lastly, there are gonna be some issues that are gonna take longer term effort. Um, some of those include our studies uh, and benchmarks internationally. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done, but I think this is a good time to celebrate. This is a good place to celebrate. We're uh, in Orlando. I hope you'll all have a fabulous time here. Um, and I'm looking forward to our conversation uh, during out the, uh, the course of this day. Um, and John, I don't know if we have time for, uh, for questions, uh, but I'm certainly available uh, to you during the day for, uh, for discussions, and I'll look forward to that. Thank you so much for your attention and for your work. I, I think we actually do have a few minutes for questions. If anyone has a question, I don't think we have mics, so I will come to you and, and try to make sure we get it. Anyone have a question for Dr. Copan? This, this is the change leader in our community right now. He is, he is the face of federal tech transfer. I don't know if you knew that, but now you do, <laughs> right? Any questions? Yes, Mr. Detloff. You can get real close to me. And, there's, there's actually a mic coming from the back. Thank you, you just saved me. <laughs> that, that was a little too close for comfort, guys. <laughs> the um, FLC business aggregation of all of the technologies available um, serves industry a tremendous number of ways. But they also need the university technologies. Yeah. Uh, we're mostly the funders of those universities. I'd like to recommend that we require them to join the Autumn database with yeah. the FLC business. Has anything actually happened in that regard yet? Uh, thanks very much for that question. Um, and I think with the mic, everybody was able to hear it. Um, Autumn has been a close partner with the FLC um, and, uh, and really in this entire uh, journey for the uh, ROI initiative. Um, we are actually in conversation with Autumn about how do we aggregate uh, the appropriate Autumn and uh, FLC-wide data in a way that's truly usable and user-friendly. Uh, you may know that uh, with Autumn's strong outreach to uh, foreign universities, that actually it's a very high proportion of the Autumn uh, technologies that are offered uh, through, their, um, uh, through the uh, Autumn website that, um, uh, that are uh, representing uh, other nations' uh, IP. Uh, and so we'll have to look at how we, uh, how we manage that uh, together. But I believe that there are opportunities uh, for us to do that. Um, the other change that we're in the midst of is uh, the academic community, of course, has been using iEdison for many years. That's a system that is in need of modernization. There was a report that came out of the National Academies saying that um, iEdison should not only be improved, but it should be transitioned to NIST so that it would be part of a centralized support for the community of, uh, of tech transfer in academia as well. So we're in the midst of those conversations as well uh, with the NIH to transition uh, iEdison 
appropriately to a new home um, and to really modernize that tool uh, so that it uses the, uh, the latest uh, technologies and, and ultimately can be much more uh, broadly accessible through the cloud uh, versus the system that it represents today. It's a really sort of a legacy kind of clunky product. Um, but uh, we're delighted at the interest there at NIH. They've done a yeoman's uh, effort over the last many years in keeping that system going on behalf of the community of science at our universities. So any, uh, any other questions? I'll, I'll get you in just a second. Dr. Stackhouse. Hi, well, thank you. I'm Tom Stackhouse with the yeah. National Cancer Institute, NIH. Um, what has happened here has just been fantastic <coughs> and exciting, and the way you presented it this morning was just wonderful, so thank you very much for that. Um, I've been part of the Lab to Market uh, initiative and um, also am concerned about these changes happening, how they're going to be implemented, because I think they're, they're great, but they're very wide scope. Yep. Um, so just mentioning, for example, the cultural change that might have to happen with our general counsel. That's just one, right? right. How, are there plans for how to really make the changes happen? Yeah. Uh, thanks so much. That's, um, uh, that's a very insightful question. And indeed, in uh, one of my charts, I talked about having uh, an action plan and, and a deployment plan that, that really makes sure um, that this uh, program is ultimately rolled out in a way that's thoughtful, uh, that's doable. Uh, for example, uh, one of the findings in the uh, ROI green paper um, is the potential benefit of having a not-for-profit foundation uh, to be accessible for the, uh, uh, for the federal lab. Uh, so there's a foundation for NIH, uh, USDA has, uh, has had a foundation as well, but um, many of the federal labs do not have an appropriately commissioned nonprofit arm's length entity 501c3 so that it's not going to be doing lobbying. So there, some foundations have kind of gotten crosswise with Congress for um, either uh, indirectly or otherwise uh, uh, supporting uh, activity that's seen as, uh, as uh, lobbying. And so we want to make sure that as we work with the legislators on the Hill, um, and we already have very strong support for this uh, 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 journey of, uh, of change, um, that's just one example that's going to require the creation of new entities. It's going to require the creation um, and the funding um, of new types of initiatives. Uh, but the beauty of that for a government-owned, government-operated laboratory um, is to actually have an entity that's set up to support technology transfer for you. Um, and that risk then can be shifted to that entity the Department of Energy system has mostly government-owned contractor-operated facilities, and I must say that speaking with friends at uh, the government-owned, government-operated laboratories, including the one in the DOE system, they're kind of jealous uh, because of the flexibilities at having a, an arm's-length contractor organization um, provides. Um, and so that enables um, new entrepreneurial engagement um, but the culture building uh, is something that we must uh, proceed with as a long-term uh, journey. You know, I, I, I mentioned and, and Tom reflected on the, uh, the fact that uh, having lawyers retrained or in some cases, uh, you know, uh, new blood brought in uh, is very important. We saw that with the creation of the ACT process at the Department of Energy uh, because the DOE lawyers were not used to that. And, and it took some time, it took some culture building uh, to become uh, comfortable with this new mechanism, with this new flexibility that was offered, and that it's okay uh, to accept certain risks uh, because we actually have a mechanism that provides a protection for the federal government, uh, but also enables the right thing to happen for U.S. technology transfer. Um, it's, it's going to be a journey, isn't it? Uh, we know that within every organization, uh, the most important thing is first to be aware of the cultural uh, issues um, and then to work systematically to ensure that from the top as well as throughout the organization, 
that there's constancy of purpose to the kind of change that's needed and that people see themselves safely in this new space, that they can see the value of unleashing American innovation. That is what we all seek. Thank you. I think we have one last question, right. then you guys can grab Walt one-on-one. -on -one. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, Dr. Copan. Uh, thank you for your uh, enlightening speech. And it sounds like you have quite a few ideas um, of how things can move forward for the future. Um, I'm just wondering, do you have any recommendations, um, and I'll be perfectly honest with you, for years I've been dealing with the FLC as an adopted little sister. Um, uh, I'm not a Fed, and I uh, am from Montgomery County, so I do understand the sort of inner workings of how people have to operate. It's difficult when the top down does not always understand the importance yeah. or the value of what you do. So I'm not speaking on behalf of myself, but those who I may have conversed with over the past 10, 11 years. What recommendations do you have uh, for helping those professionals who are in the field and yet may not be receiving the kind of support that you offer within your institution to theirs? How should they coach and educate up? Or is there a think tank group that you can yeah. form to help them? I mean, how yeah. can we help support yeah. everyone yeah. towards this mission? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, this is a topic, I think, for a longer conversation. I look forward to, um, uh, to continuing that uh, also at our session at 1 o'clock this afternoon. Um, it is part of um, reinforcement uh, at the top that we can utilize the messages that are being created now uh, for, the, uh, for the current uh, leadership. We'll be having a meeting of all the science and technology principals, the 17 primary science agencies, um, in the beginning of May. Uh, they'll be hearing this message loud and clear. There will be documentation to support that. I must say that there are plenty of think tanks that are out there that are also going to be writing a lot about this because they're excited about the potential that this represents. Um, and the National Academies are also involved, so we'll have some new pieces that we can refer to uh, so that uh, when uh, leaders such as myself have moved on to another role uh, and, uh, and there are new leaders within your respective organizations, that there is a set of expectations that are documented for future performance as well. It's going to take, um, it, it's a journey that we're upon. It's a culture building journey. Um, and I think we have uh, an ongoing responsibility to ensure the reinforcement of that message throughout our respective organizations at, at, at all levels. Thanks once again. So thank you. Let's, let's thank Dr. Copan. Thank you, sir. Thank you for, very much for your leadership. So there's a session that will continue in here almost immediately on the Manufacturing Institutes. At the other end of the long hallway, on the flip side, is the, uh, the sessions on the other transactional authorities. So um, we went a little long, so if you don't mind, quickly uh, adjust whether you're staying here or going to the next place. Thank you. <laughs>